Thank you so much. Our 4,000 United Choir has truly offered this glorious throne anthem to glorify God. Now, we just started our 2020 summer conference online because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in the United States, there are more than 150,000 deaths in the United States. Um, I, there, the numbers were tolling really high um, because of COVID-19. Uh, many churches in Korea have canceled their summer conference or not having at all. But Pyongyangji Church um, has been blessed to host a summer conference online so that all the nations can come together. Um, and I think this is a very blessing for our nation and all the nations who are represented here. Let us truly um, thank God for his word will always prevail and have a victory. So today, this is going to be the very first um, lecture as the opening service. And we're going to uh, find grace of God through the message today. Let's open to our lecture notes. The very first page, let's start with the lecture one. The title is Offering Sacrifices in Ezekiel's Temple. This is a grace abounding redemptive administration of offering sacrifices in Ezekiel's temple. The reason I'm writing in English today is not because I'm good in English, but uh, many people from all around the world are watching this right now, so that even the non-Korean participants can follow our writing on the board. There has been requests that we write in English. Um, not everything, but I'll try as much as I can to put in English on the board so that we can all follow together. Um, so, Ezekiel's temple is revealed in chapters 40 to 48. So, from chapter 40 to 48, there are 260 verses. 260 verses in total. But amazingly, of these 260 verses, 64 verses are devoted to the priests and offering sacrifices. So this means about 25% of the entire revelation of Ezekiel's temple is devoted to priests and offering sacrifices. We have been studying about Ezekiel's temple, which foreshadows the true temple in the end. We all want to go into the temple. But of all the revelation about Ezekiel's temple, one-fourth of all the revelation is about offering sacrifices. In other words, worship. So this means even if we were to understand that in-depth revelation of Ezekiel's temple, those who do not worship God will not be able to come into Ezekiel's temple. So the more we study Ezekiel's temple in depth, the more we are able to give a perfect whole worship to our Father God. We must become people, people who give perfect, perfect offerings and sacrifices to our God. So Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says that we must present our bodies a living 
and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. God wants our worship to be a living worship, spiritual worship, not a defiled worship, but a holy worship. And most of all, our worships must be acceptable to God. Enoch walked with God for 300 years, and he was transfigured in the end and was taken up to heaven. And concerning Enoch, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, he received a testimony from God that he was pleasing to him. Now, what pleases God? God is pleased with worships. So let us really hold on to this word. For if we really want to enter into Ezekiel's temple, then we will never skip on our worship services. All the more, we will give our worship services in a way that is acceptable to God. So all of this is actually written in our lecture notes. So that um, of the 260 verses in total, for the offerings at the altar of burnt offering, it is from Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 18 through 27. And there, there are total 10 verses. Now, for the ordinances for the Levites and the priests, there's a record in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 9 through 31, and there are total 23 verses. And for the ordinances for the prince's offering and the feast offerings, this is written in Ezekiel chapter 45, verse 13 through 25, which means there are 13 verses. Lastly, sacrifices and offerings for the Sabbaths and new moons is in Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 1 through 18, and total 18 verses. So a total of 64 verses are devoted to the priests and offering sacrifices. So 64 out of 260 verses means it is about 25%. So let's go to our lecture notes and fill in the blanks. Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 1 through 18. Um, on page on the second page on our lecture note. So Ezekiel's temple is revealed in chapters 40 to 48, which has 260 verses in total. Amazingly, how many verses are for offering sacrifices? 64. So this is about 25% of the entire revelation of Ezekiel's temple. Shall we all read Romans chapter 12, verse 1 together? Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, let's go to point number one. We're going to examine when do the gates in the temple open. So when the gate opens. Only when the gate of the temple opens, we can go in to meet God. So when we come to church, the very purpose is to meet our living God, right? Now, we must note that there are times when the temple gate opens in Ezekiel's temple. When does the gate open? First, during the Sabbaths and the new moons. During the days of Sabbath and new moons. So Sabbath is equivalent to Lord's Days when we worship, just like today. When we observe the Lord's Day, that is when the gate of the temple opens and we are able to meet God and experience His glory. Also in once a month, our districts have our monthly worships. 
And so new moon is like um, that worship that happens once a month to uh, give a worship to God on the new moons. God commanded the temple gates open on this day as well. And this is found in Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 2. It's on our handout. Uh, we're going to read from verse 1 through 2. Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 1 through 2. Verse 1. Let's read together. Thus says the Lord God, the gate of the inner court facing east shall be shut the six working days. But it shall be opened on the Sabbath day and opened on the day of the new moon. So the gates are open on the Sabbath day and also on the day of the new moon. However, there are different limitations as to how far you can go in the temple. The gates open. but you cannot go in all the way. There is a limit to how far you can go. So first, let's look at the people, the lay people. The lay people can come in only to the doorway of the inner gate facing east. So the very entranceway, the front. So people can come in only to the doorway. Now this doorway in Hebrew is petach, petach. And Petach is a doorway. So it is the entrance way. And this is found in Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 3. Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 3. It says that people can worship at the doorway of the gate, which is only the entrance, the very front. Now, secondly, for the prince, it's a little different. For the prince... Even if he were a prince, you cannot go all the way. Prince can come only um, to the threshold of the inner gate facing east. Threshold. Threshold. Threshold in Hebrew is mipton. 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 So this is the diagram of the Ezekiel's temple. So this is the outer court. You see the altar of burnt offering? This is the inner court. Inner court. But people can come to only the doorway of the inner gate facing east. People can come in only this far. However, the prince can enter through this doorway and will stand at the threshold of the inner gate facing east. So right at the edge here. This is the threshold of the inner gate, and he can come in only this far. He will not be able to step into the inner court. He cannot. And who can come into the inner court? The priests. Priests can come in as far as the inner court. So the um, doorway is for the people. The threshold is for the prince. And the inner court is for the priests. So the people and the prince and the priests, they have different um, areas. We are the people of God. But in the New Testament era, God has made us, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, 1 Peter 2, verse 9, God has made us as the royal priesthood. The royal priesthood. God has made us already like the royal priesthood. So yes, we are people who could come only this far. But what grace this is that we are royals, we are prince, we are king, we can come to the threshold. Not only that, because he made us as his priest, we can come in all the way into the inner court. What an amazing blessing this is. This is the sanctuary. This is a sanctuary building, right? 
This is where the glory of God fills. So when we go into the inner court, we are able to meet the glory of God. For reference, in Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 4 through 5 says, Because the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate facing toward the east, and so the glory of the Lord filled the house. So when we come into the inner court, we are able to witness this amazing glory of the Lord filling the entire house. What is then the glory of God? Glory of God simply is light, bright light. So even though there's a darkness upon the land, once God's glory comes in, even the land of darkness will transform into bright place. That is written in Ezekiel chapter 43 verse 2. So yes, today we may have many problems with our children. Maybe the business is not running well. We are about to have a bankruptcy. But if we just usher in the glory of God, even the land of darkness will be filled with light. So on the Lord's Day, on this Sabbath day, when we come into church, the house of God, that glory of God will enter us. So until that we go into the kingdom of God, let us never be lazy in worshiping God. Let us become even all the more diligent in worshiping God so that we can always have the glory of Father God filling us from head to toe. And I pray this blessing upon you in the name of the Lord. From now on, the world will be such a way that the worship will become more difficult. If the, something like COVID-19 hits again and it can be even stronger than we have now, then our churches will all close down, right? So the time to worship will be even more difficult then. But let us keep our post of worship, never be lazy in worshiping God. And when we do so, then we can become the central figures who will enter into Ezekiel's temple. So let's go to um, page two on our lecture note again to fill in the blanks. Circle number one, people can come in only to the doorway of the inner gate facing east. So answer is a doorway. And circle number two, even the prince, even if he's a prince, he can come only in, um, can come in only to the threshold of the inner gate facing east. Threshold. Circle number three, God's what is manifested when the gate opens? God's glory is manifested when the gate opens. Ezekiel chapter 43 verse 4 to 5 says this, And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate facing toward the east, and the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Let's read verse 2. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east, and His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Isn't this true? The earth that was dark now shone because of God's glory. So may we experience the glory of Father God through worship and fulfill our duty of transforming everything that is dark into bright light. Now, we have examined when the gate opens. So first was the Sabbath and the new moons, and the second time the gate opens is when we give free will offering. Free will offering. In English, this is a free will offering. It's not something that you do because you're obligated because, or because somebody pushed you to do so, but you do this in complete voluntary heart. Now, that's in Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 12. Let's read this together. It's in our lecture notes. When the prince shall provide, when, when the prince provides a free will offering, a burnt offering, or peace offerings, as well as a free will offering to the Lord, the gate facing east shall be opened for him, and he shall provide his burnt offering and his peace offerings as he does on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go out, and the gate shall be shut after he goes out. Amen. 
So in Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 12, it says this. Now, free will. What does free will mean? Free will means it's giving beyond one's ability. It is working beyond one's ability. It's dedic- It's about dedicating beyond one's ability. That's what real free will is about. And this will go beyond one's ability. For instance, I only have $10. But the people who want to give their free will beyond their abilities, they will give $20, for instance. The Church of Macedonia had offerings like this. They were in a great ordeal of affliction at the time. So although uh, because of they, they were suffering from such a great affliction, they could not really do much of offerings. But Second Corinthians chapter two, uh, chapter eight, verse two and three says that they gave beyond their ability. How was it possible? Because these people had abundance of joy. It, it overflowed in their lives. So that because of joy overflowed, they could also go beyond this great ordeal of affliction. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, the Bible says that before they gave offering to God, they first gave themselves to the Lord. If we give ourselves to the Lord, then naturally the wealth that I have will come, the children that I have will come, the cars that I own will naturally also be dedicated to God, right? So before giving a physical offering, the Church of Macedonia first gave themselves to the Lord. This is a true free will offering. And if we serve for our Father God at church with a mind like this, that's when the gates open. We will meet the glory of God. We will not meet God of someone else, but we will meet our God, my God, my Father. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. So they were in deep poverty, but their joy abounded. So verse 3, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5 says, And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So, secondly, we must pray for such a willing spirit because His free will doesn't come on our own. God has to grant it to us. As stated in Psalm 51, verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with the willing spirit. So when we overflow with the joy of salvation, then we are filled with this willing spirit. So we must not um, dedicate ourselves according to man's ways or man's will, but we must be willing according to God's will. Some people make work really, really hard, but some, some of them actually hold on to their own will, their own desire. But we must really work hard by holding on to God's will, not my will or my plan. So we must always examine whatever I'm doing right now. Is this in accordance with God's will? We must have always deep prayer to find this out and also be engaged in prayer for a willing spirit, that God gives us the willing spirit. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 on our handout. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to whose will? 
according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. So circle number three, the free will is, is shown through two things. It's shown through a burnt offering and also a peace offering. And this is about self-sacrifice. Burnt offering is about self-sacrifice. So those who really have a willing spirit um, ha sacrifice himself. As we read earlier in Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 12, the gate of the temple will open when there is a free will offering. So a burnt offering or peace offerings. Peace offering. This peace offering means giving thanks. So when we give peace offerings, um, the distorted relationship will be restored and be reconciled. So if we really seek the will of God, we must give ourselves voluntarily. And that will always involve self-sacrifice. Jesus prayed, not my will be done, but may your will be done, Father. And because of this, he died on the cross as our sacrifice. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. See, Jesus sacrificed himself. If you look at the Chinese character for sacrifice, on the left side, there is a character of a cow or an ox. Ox gives everything it has to, father, uh, to the owner. And so when we also give everything that we have to Father God, when we sacrifice ourselves, that is when the gate opens. But many times people don't want to see any loss. They always want to see their gain or profit. Um, sometimes in our marital relationship, um, the, let's say a wife may be nagging at the husband saying, how come you never do anything for me, but if your daughter asks you for something, then you do everything. But that's true. When dads hear the um, uh, mom's nagging, that they don't want to do anything. But when the daughter says, Daddy, could you do this for me? Then the dad will go out right away and get whatever the daughter wanted. Why? Because he really loves the daughter. Okay, that doesn't mean he only loves daughter and not the wife. Of course he loves the wife too. But sometimes the love for the wife seems to cool. You know, but the love for daughter, it gets bigger and bigger. I'm sorry, this is a reality, right? <laughs> okay, the daughter is, uh, the daddies love uh, daughter more. They are powerless when it comes to their little girls. But going back, what is cross? Cross is a vertical line, means we love God above us. And the horizontal part is we love our neighbors on our sides. So if we really have a life of the cross, when God says to do something, we are so powerless as to obey His will. And so if God tells us to love our neighbors, we must love our neighbors even if we were to see loss from loving our neighbors. But a lot of times we don't want to love, we don't want to lose, we don't want to yield. That is not the life of the cross. To people like that, the door of the gate will, uh, the door of the temple will not open. So, why does the temple gate not open to me? It may be perhaps because you have not lived the life of the cross, the life of sacrifice. Let us try to live a life of sacrifice. Our Father God in heaven knows everything. 
all the loss and all the disadvantage that we might have faced. God is aware of this, and He will repay you for all of that. Let us not put our life on line for the things of this world, but let us put our life on line for things in the heavenly world that's waiting for us. Yes, we have a lot to say, but let us keep our mouth closed. We have a lot to oppose, but let us just keep those things in check. And just keep the life of the cross by showing the love through self-sacrifice. And I pray this blessing upon you in the name of the Lord. So this, uh, thus far, we have examined when the gate opens in the Ezekiel's temple. First is when um, on the Sabbath day and the day of the new moon. Second, uh, when there is free will offering, like a burnt offering and peace offering. Uh, they're just so thankful of the joy of salvation that uh, they give burnt offering and peace offerings. Then the gate will open. And so Colossians chapter 2 verse 7, abound all the more in thanksgiving. May we our lives be filled with thanksgiving to our God. So we have covered um, everything under point number one. So let's go on to now point number two. The sacrifice on the Sabbath day in Ezekiel's temple. We're going to look at this in more detail. The Bible has a specific descriptions of the sacrifice worship that God wants us to give on the day of Sabbath, which shows what kind of worship we must give on the Lord's Day. Now, one thing that we must note is the amount of sacrifices in Ezekiel's temple is much more than the Sabbath offerings given in the Old Testament. So Ezekiel Temple's sacrifices is much, much more than the Sabbath offerings according to the law and the rest of the Old Testament. So the chart is on our chart. So let's take a look at this. So or, num, Book of Numbers chapter 28 is the law in the Old Testament. God has um, told the people to give um, burnt offering for Sabbath, which will be two male lambs, one year old without defect. It's um, two male lambs, one year old without defect. Number chapter 28 says, We must give two male lambs, one year old, without defect on the Sabbath day. And this is according to the law. But in Ezekiel's temple, it's not two male lambs, but six lambs, and the one big ram without blemish. So according to the law, two male lambs. But in Ezekiel's temple, total seven. So a lot more, right? So now go to the grain offerings. Grain offerings for the Sabbath. Um, according to the law, you have to give two-tenths of an ephah of a fine flour. But in Ezekiel's temple, per ram, you have to give an ephah, whole ephah, which is 22 liters. That's five times more. Now for the lambs, for six lambs without the blemish, per lamb, you have to give as much as you're able to. So that means you have to give a lot more than 22 liters. So we can see that the offerings for the Sabbath according to the law in the Old Testament is much lesser than the offerings that's given on the Sabbath day in the Ezekiel's temple. So Ezekiel's temple has a lot more offerings than in the um, law in the Old Testament. What does this show us? This shows us that the abundance of the blessings that we have in the kingdom of God is incomparably more abundant to the blessings on the earth. So it shows how abundant our blessings are in the kingdom of God compared to the blessings on the earth. So we may say, I've been living by uh, 30 or 40, 50 years. By holding on to this word only, I came this far. 
but still my life uh, is not, uh, it's still poor, and I'm not living as well as other people. So yes, it may, you may feel despair because of this, but I ask you to don't despair. Because the blessings that Father has stored up for you in His kingdom is so much greater, so much more than you can ever imagine. It is not comparable to any great glory or wealth that's found on this earth. So let us put all our hope, not here on earth, but in the kingdom of God. None of us are poor people. By all means, because you have an abundance of wealth and blessings piled up for you in the kingdom of God. He is waiting for us to come, right? But the time passes by so quick, right? We see that all the years that we have lived just went by so quickly. It doesn't matter if you're 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s. You have just really sped through your life, and that's how quickly we're going to go to our Father God in heaven, right? So let's go to our lecture notes. At the bottom of page 3, parenthesis number 1, the amount of sacrifice is much more than the Sabbath offerings in the Old Testament. So let's go to Numbers chapter 28, verse 9 on page 4. Then on the Sabbath day, two male lambs, one year old, without defect. So lambs, uh, kebesh. He's pointing this out because there is a mistake in Korean translation. So, Kebesh. In Numbers chapter 28, verse 9. And this lamb in Ezekiel's temple is also Kebesh. So, lamb, it means lamb. So, two lambs, one year old without defect. In Numbers chapter 28, verse 9. And for uh, two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, that's 4.4 liter. And, but Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 4 to 5 says, the burnt offering, which is Prince Shell's offer, is six lambs without blemish and a ram without blemish. And verse 5, and the grain offering shall be an ephah with a ram. One ephah is 22 liters, and the grain offering with the lambs. So each lamb must be um, given with the grain offering, and you give as much as you're able to give. Now, this shows that the abundance of the blessings in the kingdom of God is incomparable to the blessings on the earth. So, those who yearn to enter Ezekiel's temple, therefore, offer abundant sacrifices. So, on the Lord's day, uh, when our offerings are abundant, and our offerings are a lot more than the Old Testament time in Ezekiel's temple, right? So if you learned this a long time ago, if you give a $10 for offering, today we can give $20 or $10,000, right? Uh, $20 or $200, right? So we know by faith now our uh, offering, uh, our, our blessings in the kingdom of God is so much more. And realizing this, that we will want to give more offerings than before. So just pray. When we pray, then God will provide even the offerings sufficiently that, so that you can give Him as well. And point number two, many lambs are offered. Um, for your reference, if it's a, a male, male um, sheep, it's a ram. But the baby, baby um, sheep is lamb. Okay. Baby lamb. So God says to uh, give a lots of baby lamb. 
So six. A lamb is uh, really young. It's a baby lamb. And so they are like the most precious offering. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Jesus is a Passover lamb. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Jesus is a lamb unblemished and spotless. When Abel gave offerings to God, he gave the firstling of the flock, and that is referring to the lamb, the lamb that is less than one year old. And so lambs represent um, the most precious offering. It is the most precious offering. So if we want to enter Ezekiel's temple, then we must always give whatever is the most, most, most precious to us. Uh, even though you say, I know the dimension of Ezekiel's temple, I understood this deep revelation, but our offering is not as abundant as it is before. That means our thanksgiving and offering is not really there. So compared to the uh, time of the law in the Old Testament, the, in the Old Testament, the offerings are even more abundant. So we must really practice that, right? So on the number two, let's fill in the blank. Lambs being less than one year old are the most precious offering. Circle number one. Saints who yearn for Ezekiel's temple give offerings that are most precious. So the answer is precious. And Jesus is most precious in circle number two. And let's go to point number three, the small point three. Besides the offerings on the Sabbath day and the new moons, there are other offerings. It's called continual offerings that are given daily. Continual offerings. That means um, offerings are given every day. So it's continual offerings given every day. So according to the law in the Old Testament, you give one in the morning and another in the, at twilight. So you have to give in the morning and at the twilight. That's in Numbers chapter 28, verse 3 to 4. It says give offering every day, one in the morning and the other at twilight. But in Ezekiel's temple, there is no offering at twilight in continual offerings. In Ezekiel's temple, there is no offering at twilight in continual offerings. This foreshadows that there is no night in the kingdom of heaven. So in Revelation chapter 21, verse 25, and Revelation chapter 22, verse 5, in New Jerusalem, in the kingdom of God, there is no, light, no night. Why? Because... God's glory will shine, and God's glory is more powerful than any sunlight. And so, and Jesus, the Lamb, will illumine them, will become the lamp. So there is no need of any, any light. So in Ezekiel's temple, God, did not, God said not to give offering at twilight to teach us that there is no night in the kingdom of God. When our children cause trouble, that's night. When we have a problem because of our money, that can be night. But I, um, I, there are many things in our lives that may put us at nighttime, right? But in kingdom of God, there is no night. Why? Because God's glory shines. So as long as we live with the glory of God, it will drive out all darkness. And I pray that every household of the word around the world be filled with the glory of Father God. And I pray this blessing upon you in the name of the Lord. So let's fill in the blanks for number three. Circle number one, there is no offerings at twilight and continual offerings. There's no offering at twilight in continual offerings in Ezekiel's temple. 
And uh, number two, circle number two, um, Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 13, it says, You shall provide a lamb a year old without blemish for burnt offering to the Lord daily. Morning by morning, you shall provide it. So there's no night, right? Circle number two, there is no night in the kingdom of heaven. So let's go to the final, number three. The first fruits must be offered in Ezekiel's temple. The first fruits must be offered as the command of God. The first fruits must be offered. So here is God. And here is a people. So people give their first fruits to God. And this is in Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 14. And, and if you read in King James Version, it says first fruits. So let's read. And they shall not sell of it, neither exchange, nor alienate the first fruits of the land, for it is holy unto the Lord. But in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30, God gave these first fruits, the people gave to God, He took them and gave to the priests. So the people give the first fruits to God, and then in turn, God will give that to the priests. Then what do the priests do? Instead of receiving the first fruits, the people, uh, the priests, their duty is to bless the people. And those blessings will come upon the people just as they bless. That's why Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 15, verse 29. In Romans chapter 15, verse 29, Apostle Paul said, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Not just in your ordinary blessing, but fullness of blessing. In Numbers chapter 6, 6 verse 27, in Numbers chapter 20, it says that priests shall invoke God's name on the sons of Israel, and then God will bless them. So the priest must invoke God's name upon the people, and then God will bless them. So the priests are the channel of blessing. God is the one who gives a blessing, but the priests are the channel of blessings. So when we give our first fruits to God, God will bless us. That's why we always give the first to God. Let's say I started a new job. It's my first salary. We must give that to God. That's the first fruit. So we can just think like we never got the first salary. Why? Because it doesn't belong to me. So I give to God first. Such person will receive blessings from God, and this is his principle. So let's go to our lecture notes. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30 at the bottom of page 4. The first of all the first fruits of every kind and every contribution of every kind from all your contributions shall be for the priests. Right, And then you shall also give to the priest in the first of your dough to cause a blessing to rest on your house. So when we give our first fruits, God will bring blessings upon us. So priest's duty is to bless. Okay. Now let's go to point three. Spiritually, we must become the first fruits. We ourselves must become the first fruits. 
Like the Church of Macedonia, we do not only give material offerings, but ourselves. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, it says, um, with the Lamb on the Mount Zion, 144,000 were standing. And verse 4 says that they are the first fruits. They are the first fruits to God. So it tells us that we too must become the first fruits for God. So if we don't ripe, if the fruits do not ripen or unripe fruits will fall. That is found in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 21. This word fall also means like corruption, like the fall, right? So today, our faith must continue to be ripe. If we are unripened, then we will fall. We must remember this. So we must be ripened. Then how can we become ripened? We must be ripened like Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says Jesus kept increasing in four ways. Jesus kept increasing in four ways. First, his wisdom kept increasing, and his stature kept increasing. And then he kept increasing in favor with God, and also he increased in favor with men. So wisdom increasing means um, a mental maturity or intellectual maturity. So we must become mature. We must become mature. We, uh, intellectually, we must be mature. So also increasing in the stature means, yes, physically we must be mature. And being in favor with God means we must be spiritually mature. And um, being in favor with men means we must be mature in our human relationships with others. So this is interpersonal relationships. Jesus was loved by God and also by people. So how are we today? I would say there is a mother-in-law. And isn't the mother, mother-in-law loved by the daughters-in-law? When the mother-in-law is coming home, then all the daughters-in-law says, run away. Right? That means she's not really loved by people, but Jesus was loved by people. He was in favor with men. We must be like that. We must know why, uh, why am I not in favor with other people? It's usually... What is a secret to be more respected as the older you get? Close your mouth and open your wallet, they say. Then people will always respect you and honor you more. But let's really apply that to ourselves. Are we really in favor with the people around us? Let's deeply think about this. And as we do so, we will become more mature. Age itself does not guarantee that we are becoming more mature physically, spiritually, and socially. So, or, right? The age doesn't necessarily mean that we are becoming mature in all these aspects. Um, people say, wow, that person is doing really well, or that, that person is not really doing well. This doing well does not necessarily mean the money, how much money they have, because there are people who have you know, millions of dollars, and yet they always fight in their family. But people who live in a small room, and many people living in this tiny room, it means, uh, but still they are living very happily. So when somebody's doing well, means, you know, they're doing well in their relationship with their parents, with their children, with their family. They are the ones who are living well. They're the ones who are doing well. 
So living well means a good relationships. So we must have good relationships. But what is a life of um, a, a truly living well is to have a people, those a people who have good relationship with God. So let's ask this question to ourselves: Are we in good relationship with God? When we go to God, would He be really happy to see us and will accept us, and or would He say? Ah, uh, he does not even look at me when he's doing well, but he comes to me only when he's in trouble. Perhaps, isn't that what God is saying about us? The verse tells us that Jesus was in favor with God and in favor with men. And Jesus called God as his Father, and he was in unity, unity with Father. He always says, I am in Father, and Father is in me. That's in John chapter 17, verse 21 through 23. So, I pray that our relationship with God will be good so that He will always want to bless you with all His heart's desire, that He wants to help you and support you in all His desire. So let's go to page 5. Um, circle uh, number 2, when something is ripe, it means it is mature. So let's go to Luke chapter 2, verse 52. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So in Matthew chapter 21, there is a parable. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 34, it says that the owner sent slaves. So in the Old Testament time, God sent um, the messengers, but they were all killed. So in the chapter 21, verse 37, the owner sent a son, which is um, uh, symbolizing Jesus. But the people even killed the son. So in verse 40, it says, now then the owner will come. There will be a time when the owner will come. That is speaking about the end time. So when the owner of the vineyard comes, that he will give this um, vineyard to other vine growers. So I will, I'll, I'm going to give this to, I'm going to rent this out vineyard to you so that you will be able to harvest. That's in Matthew chapter 21, verse 41. I will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proper fruits and proper seasons. And then it says that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and be given to the people producing the fruit of it. That's in Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. So you can tell a tree by its fruit. We must bear fruit right now. Fruit is never possible if we walk away from the Word. Only those who abide in the Word can bear fruit. And that's why Jesus said, in John chapter 15, verse 2, every branch um, that does not bear fruit will be thrown into fire. And then he says in John chapter 15, verse 5, He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. But then in John chapter 15, verse 7 through 8, he says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you. So, I'm, when I abide in Him, it's the same as when my word abides in Him. So, the word abide means dwell. It means living in us. So, 
So word of God must fill us. He must always be dwelling in us in such an abundance, right? That he's not going to uh, come today and he's not here tomorrow. Not like that. So when we live a life like that, um, John chapter 15 verse 8 says, We will bear much fruit and will glorify God the Father. So if we do not bear fruits, we cannot bring glory to God. See, you can, how can you know what kind of tree it is? You can tell it by its fruit. If it bears apple, then we know it's an apple tree. If it bears a fig, then we know it's a fig tree. So when a good fruit is um, made through our lives, then the people will be able to say, wow, this is a good tree. That's why the owner of the vineyard will rent it out to the people who produce fruits of it. God has given us this world. He's rented this so that may I pray that the word of Father will abide in us so that we will always bear lots of fruit. So let's look at our lecture notes on page 5 on circle number 3. A tree is known by its fruit, and Matthew chapter 21 verse 43 says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. Can we also read Matthew chapter 21 verse 40 through 41? It says, When the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Circle number four, we can bear much fruit when we abide in the word. Matthew chapter 21, verse 43 says, We can tell the tree by its fruit. Let's read uh, John chapter 15, verse 7 through 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So the one the word abides in us, we will bear lots of fruit. But if we don't bear the fruit, we will not prove ourselves to be father's disciples. What's the point if we say that we are disciples if we are just not? If we don't bear any fruit without sacrificing ourselves, we cannot bear any fruit. So in John chapter 12, verse 34, John chapter 12, verse 34, And also, John chapter 12, verse 24, when the wheat falls, single grain falls, then it will bear lots of fruit. And I pray that we will live such a life. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for inviting all the churches around the world. to partake in this very precious summer conference. And for the first time, we're having this online. And Father, we thank you so much. Ezekiel's temple is where we give abundant offerings, at the place where we give the most precious offerings to you. Father, we desire to enter into Ezekiel's temple. So please help us to give you even more abundant offerings than the past, even more precious offerings than the past. 25% of the revelation of, uh, revelation of Ezekiel's temple is about giving sacrifice offerings because we so desire to enter into Ezekiel's temple. Help us to love worship more and never miss out on worships, but be more diligent in worshiping you. Also, we learn that in Ezekiel's temple, we must offer the first fruits, and we so pray that we become that first fruit ourselves. So please bless us that our characters will become mature, our spiritual lives will become more mature, our social lives will also become very mature in our interpersonal relationships. 
we also learn that if we don't bear fruit, we cannot be your disciples. So we pray that we will never leave the word, but will abide in your words. So we will bear lots of fruits to the very end. Even if uh, the COVID-19 pandemic may uh, block our ways until the day of fruition, Please help us to never leave your word, but always abide in your word. Father, there are many of your saints and families who are afflicted with illnesses and problems that they cannot solve on their own. We pray that you will lay your right hand on them, your hand that's covered with the undrawn blood that you shed on the cross. So now I command my name of Jesus Christ, may all illnesses be driven out, may entire bodies be healed, and may every household be free from all the illnesses, pro poverty, and finances. Financial issues. We pray that you will be together with us for the remaining events of the worship of the summer conference. May every hour there be even more well aged wine, so that through this conference, that Jehovah Shem, our Lord, will be our God, my God. Help us to truly experience and really meet you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray in thanksgiving. Amen.